I want to take you to the Word. We're going to Psalm 51. We could go to Psalm 32. Two passages that speak to this issue in David's life. When he sinned greatly against the Lord in his latter part of his life, he really got off track. It can just go to show that if you let your guard down, even a man called a man after God's own heart can really fumble the ball in his life and really, really lose his way. I want to go there together today, and I want you to look with me in the scriptures. And uh, I am just going to start with a word of prayer and ask God's anointing and blessing over our time. Father in heaven, we give you praise over this praise and worship time that we've had. And Lord, we thank you for the band and what they uh, led us in today. We just pray that you continue to bless them. Lord, we uh, obviously need a lot of rain. <laughs> so uh, we hear these next days we're going to have quite a bit. We do pray, pray we won't float off and there won't be issues. And uh, we just pray that it will be provision, Father. And we pray that you'll rain down your righteousness in this building today and over the airways online that people would be called to holiness and would be called to living godly and following Christ with all their heart today. May folks be willing to repent of their sin today, just like David did. And Lord, we just pray that we would really examine ourselves. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. You know, it's been said that sin's a lot like a woodpecker. A few pecks, it's not a big deal. But if you left it, left, leave it without uh, being hindered, then it becomes a big, big, deep problem, doesn't it? Uh, someone has said that sin's a lot like facial hair. You have to shave every day, but it keeps coming back, doesn't it? And ladies, you might be able to relate to that on your shaving as well. We won't go there. Uh, we'll just leave that one alone. One of the favorite sayings I've, I've had for years, I don't know who originated it, but I, I will use it today and then I'll go back to it at the end of my message today. And that is simply this, that sin always takes us farther than we want to go. It costs more than we want to pay, and it keeps us longer than we want to stay. I want to tell you something. Sin is like that. In fact, this is just, just a, a message on sin and how important it is that we deal with that in our life. Remember when we read the scriptures today, we're reading an Old Testament account, and the relationship with God is a little different. The Spirit of God came, and the Spirit of God would go. But the Spirit of God in the New Testament believer lives in us, doesn't he? And it's radically different, so we'll draw some things on that. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 has one of the most incredible truths in all the Bible that you really need to get down. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, I'm going to borrow from an unusual place, and that is this. It says, there is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Everybody is in that category. The only thing that's different is that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a forgiven sinner. And those who have not remain in their sin. Remember, that's the only distinction. It's by grace that God has had mercy on you. Amen? And it's important for us to remember that. It really is. In our culture today, it's so incredible what people call things. It really is. Instead of calling it drunkenness, it's called alcoholism. It is. Instead of adultery, people talk about affairs. It sounds more harmless, doesn't it? Instead of greed, it's called ambition. How about that? Instead of idolatry, it's called diversified interest. Yeah, that really works with God. People say sin is an accident. God says it's an abomination. People say it's curiosity. God says it's a curse. People say that it's a fascination. God says that it brings fatality. God tells us that even though people talk about, it, well, it's human weakness, God says it's wickedness. The Bible, we could just go on and on naming the, we could, we, we could exhaust the English language talking about all the ways that we sin. David Here's the story. David didn't go off to war in the latter years of his reign. He was at his palace when the Bible identifies that kings went off to war with their soldiers. Many of them, as they aged, didn't fight anymore, but they would still be present with them, egging them on, coaching them, giving direction. 
Well, he didn't do that. And he's looking off his balcony one day, and he sees a beautiful woman. In fact, she's in her birthday suit. She is outside bathing. He sees her. He thinks she's beautiful. He wants her, and then he arranges to be with her. And he has sexual relations with Bathsheba. The problem is Bathsheba was married to somebody else. He's a powerful king. He can do what he wants. No, you can't. It doesn't matter who you are. You really can't do just what you want. You might think you can. You might think position, fame, and prestige holds that for you. It's a lie out of the pit of hell. It really is. Here's the reality. Everybody gives an account to God for the life they live and the choices they make. David looked off that balcony, had relations with this woman. It's, it gets even worse. He come, she comes back to him and lets him know that she's pregnant with his baby. And he makes arrangements as uh, even tries to get her husband off of the, the military field uh, back home so he can kind of cover his tracks. That doesn't work. Man won't even go home. He's a committed soldier. And then the Bible reveals to us that David had the soldiers withdraw from her husband so that he would be put to death. In other words, he was complicit to him being killed. He was part of being complicit to a murder. And that was his way of covering this up. Now, anytime you try to fix something, instead of confessing it and getting real about it, you've got issues. David did. Here's a man that God says was a man after God's own heart. And this sin just about took him down. Here's the problem. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. People, this just boggles my mind. All these years, I can tell you, people have told me one time after another, when they were involved in some sinful activity, they would say, you know what? I thought I'd be smarter than the last guy. I thought I had a way to figure this out where I wouldn't get caught. And why we think that is just arrogance. Because the, God says, be sure your sins will find you out. Whatever a man sows, whatever a woman sows, that will they also reap. It's going to happen. David has the prophet show up. And Nathan tells David a story. You remember the story? The story's like this. There was a rich man who had ample everything. And there was a poor man, and he had one little lamb. And the rich man came and took away the poor man's one little lamb. David got so incited with rage and anger himself, he said, who's this man? I'll, I'll have him thrown into prison. I'll put him to death. And Nathan says, you are the man. You're the man. Can you imagine that moment? Here's this powerful king. Doesn't feel like he's answering anybody on this. He's trying to cover it up. And God says, mm -mm, I don't care who you are. You will answer for what you do and the decisions you make. And Nathan said, you're the man. You're the one that did this. David finally responds like he's supposed to. He's repentant. He's willing to confess this. It took a confrontation from a prophet of God, but it, but it finally came to the place that David was willing to deal with his sin. And I want you to look at this because that's what this story is all about. You're reading scripture of his confession. And here's what it says. Hey, I got one question to ask you. Aren't you glad you're in church right now? It's, man, it is coming down like cats and dogs outside. Uh, man, I mean, it is it's hitting the building heavy, and I'm just glad you're in here and you're dry. Amen? We might have to have church another round just to keep you dry before it comes down. Like, really? Are you serious? Could be. Sin has its categories. Watch this. Sin has its categories. Notice in the passage, verse 1, verse 2. Something amazing is said. David is using his biblical knowledge, inspiration of God, and he says... Let me tell you about sin, what it looks like, the shapes that it takes. And here in verse 1, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your what? Your unfailing love. According 
to your great compassion, blot out what? My transgression. Listen to the next phrase. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Have you noticed that about sin, that if you don't confess it, the guilt can just drive you kind of crazy? Next thing you know, it's, it's tainting everything you do because your perspective is seen through what you're covering up. Remember the principle that I shared with you many couple years ago. I'll say it again. What you choose to uncover, God will cover. What you choose to try to hide, God will expose. It's just a principle in Scripture. It's back to that thing of being sure your sins will find you out. You cover it up, God will expose it. You confess it, and God will cover it. Amen? It's such a great way to live your life. It really is. Transgression was the first one he mentioned, a form of sin. We don't go around saying, I transgressed today. It's kind of, we don't use that terminology, do we? Transgression is a word, one of the primary words for sin, but it has to do with the concept of boundary lines. Now, I have a boundary line right here, don't I? And if I go over to the other side of the stage, then I have a, uh, a bigger boundary line, like it's probably about three foot drop. They tell us that uh, a person, if they fall out a window or out of a building, that somewhere around the third story or so, they start reaching a maximum velocity of speed. So however much I break the law of gravity, like this, is not very far. I can probably catch myself. But if I go over there and came off the maybe two and a half, three feet, um, I'm, I would probably fall. Fair enough. Probably. Maybe not. Probably would. And if I violated that by more of the law of gravity, I would pay the price for an increasing velocity for breaking the law of gravity, wouldn't I? Stepping out of bounds. That's what transgression is. It's crossing over the boundary line. In football, they have sidelines. Basketball, soccer, baseball all have foul lines that if you go out of that, play ends. You're penalized, right? And sometimes there's penalties that are beyond other penalties. But he says transgression is something he's confessing. Iniquity is such an interesting thing. In fact, it's not a good day today in Texas to use this illustration, but I'm going to use it anyway. Have you ever taken chocolate or ice cream and you didn't get home in time during a hot Texas summer? We have already. In fact, that first summer we were here, this will be our fourth one, but our first summer that we were here, we were... Um, Man, we had temperatures. I mean, it got close to the end of May, and it was 100. And it stayed like that until, I guess it was probably July. It just was a long. And we had temperatures that were 100, 101, 102, 103. And then there was a little season there for a week or two that we had 105, 106, 107, 108. And we had a 110, 111, 112 day. You remember that? I thought I had moved back to Arizona. I mean, I thought, this is like the desert. It's just a little more moist. It's really, really hot. It was a really hot summer. Listen, what happens to chocolate if you leave it in your car on a Texas summer? If you don't get home pretty quick, if you make a stop or two, your ice cream's going to be something else, isn't it? It just didn't going to make it. And I, I th you know, there's been times I thought with chocolate, I'm like, well, you know what? We could, we could put that in the refrigerator or in the freezer and it'll, it'll, it'll bring it back. Have you ever noticed it doesn't taste quite right and it definitely doesn't ever come back to shape? So it's, there's something just wrong with your chocolate, right? You know, and I'm making everybody hungry and you want, you're going to have chocolate this afternoon, right? Listen, that's exactly what he's talking about. See, the word iniquity is being distorted, twisted much like a candle in a car, much like plastic. I've seen plastic melt in the car and it changed shapes of what it was originally made. But that's what iniquity is. It's a distortion from its original design. And then he uses the very common word of sin. 
Sin means to miss the mark. It's the picture of somebody with a bow and arrow and they're trying to hit the bullseye and they try and they try and they try, but what happens? They can't hit it because you're imperfect. I know some of you are going, you haven't seen me shoot a bow and arrow because I can hit that bullseye. I never will forget taking my gun, my uh, daughter out uh, shooting and she hadn't shot a gun before. And I had taken her to the range and I wanted her to learn how to, how to shoot. And uh, I just had my little nine millimeter uh, handgun with me. And, and uh, I took her out there and lo and behold, you know, she was all over the place, didn't even hit the, the, the thing, but had it down about, you know, 25 feet, 30 feet away. And we put up a new sheet and I gave her my little loaded gun and I said, honey, this time really, really focus. You, you were doing really good there at the end. But, and she put eight shots within about an inch of each other, all right around the bullseye. And I'm like, how'd you do that? You know, some women are better marksmen than us men. Nobody's going to amen that. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was like shocked. I mean, they were her. She she had hit the bullseye a couple of times and she I mean, there wasn't a two inch spread on on all eight hits. I'm like, man, she's I taught her very well. No, she's just good. She's a natural. Uh, it's just interesting how that plays out. But the, the idea is you shoot for perfection you keep shooting, but you can't hit this bullseye because it's a sin factor. You sin. And that's what the word sin really carries. He says, and cleanse me from my sin. Did you notice that expression? Second of all, look at the consequences that sin brings into our life. Fill in that blank on number two. Sin has its consequences. What am I talking about? Look at this. There's a predictable process of sin. If you learn this, man, you're going to do something. You can teach your kids this. You can teach your grandchildren this. This is an incredible thing that you can take away for yourself. Sin, every single time, has this very predictable process. Let me take you to the book of James and show it to you. And then I'm going to back up and show it to you in Genesis chapter 2. But look at this. Here's sin's process. In the book of James chapter 1, verse 13, it says this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Did you hear that? God doesn't tempt us. It's important you understand that. This is from the half-brother of Jesus, and he's very candid and blunt in the book of James. Watch what he says. God is tempting me. No one should say that. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Everybody dig in and get that. Nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted, and here's the process of sin every single time. This is how sin works in our lives. He says, everyone, each one is tempted, what? By their own evil desire. Sorry, it's the truth. He is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. There's the fourfold process of sin and how we process into sin and how we make the choice of sin every single time. Sometimes it's elongated, other times it happens very fast. But that is the process, biblical process of how sin begins and how it's processed in our life to where we disobey God. Watch this. So sin's process, fill in the blank, starts with our desire. You have to watch what you let your heart desire. This is why we get in so much trouble with the Jones and the Smiths trying to outdo each other. And if you're a Jones or a Smith today, forgive me, I'm not trying to use you. I'm just talking about that as we, try, we have this competitive thing of trying to keep up in this rat race that we're in of having the better, uh, the bigger TV or the... The, the nicer car or the nicer home with all the gadgets and all the, the new electronics. And we, we have this thing where we just try to keep keeping up and we try to get ahead of the other person. And then, you know, they reinvest, they refinance or they get a promotion at work and they pass you up again, right? It's a trap. It really is. 
he says desire is where it begins. You see, if you desire, sleep is a wonderful thing. It's needed, isn't it? But if you sleep too much, you become a sluggard. Sex is a gift from Almighty God between a married couple and that alone. But if you misuse sex, then you become a fornicator. You become a person committing adultery. You become a person committing homosexual acts, all displeasing to God. Amen? I mean, that's what happens to that. Money and material possessions are God-given, but if you start loving money, like 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, that it is the root of every kind of evil, that if we love money, it's going to have horrible results in our life. And people do that. God gives us all kinds of foods, but man, if you just don't get a handle on that, then you can become a glutton where you just love that next food. And man, in our culture, that is such a battleground. Second of all, look at, it goes from our own evil desires, desire, to second, fill in the word, deception. Here's something that's really tricky for us. We have this desire. It's not best. It's not what God designed. But then we have this deception that takes place. Look at what the scriptures say. It says that what happens after it starts, the process of sin starts where? With your own evil desire. And then he says it moves to what? Deception. They're dragged away <laughs> and enticed. Come on. Come on. Come on. You ever been enticed? It's the work of Satan. It's the work of your flesh, the world system that beckons you to come on. It's the one that says, hey, do this now. You only live once. No, actually, you live twice. And the second time is forever. Amen? You know, you hear that on all kinds of commercials. Hey, go for it. Go for the gusto. You're just going around one time. Well, on this earth, that's true. But you're going to live forever. After desire has conceived, what happens? The third step, disobedience. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So you're looking at the process of sin. Every single time it happens, it happens sometimes really fast. Other times, it's slow. And then look at last, the last statement, and that is death. Verse 15. What does it do? After it conceives, it gives birth to sin. After it is conceived and gives birth to sin, what happens? Sin brings death. Go back to the original story, Genesis chapter 2. Go with me there. We're talking about Adam and Eve. Satan approached Eve in the form of a serpent. You may remember what she did. He, in, he does something to her as they begin their discussion, and he's zoomed in on the fruit that she can't have. It's been forbidden on the tree. People have talked about apples. They've talked about figs. It was probably a, a fig or some fruit that was already in that region. But whatever it was, there was fruit on the tree. And God had forbidden them because it would, it's the fruit that would give them knowledge of good and what? And evil. So Satan, Satan says something to her, and she looks at the tree and listen to what Eve said. Eve said she saw that it was desirable. Wow. Desire. You see it coming out right there? The process of sin started in, the, in a person of perfection, Adam too, but he's talking to her. And, he said, and it, she said she looked at the tree and saw that it looked, she looked at it and thought, man, I wonder what that tastes like. I wonder how delicious that would be. I wonder, and then Satan does something, he pulls her further and entices her in the form of a serpent. What did he say to her? She says, God said, don't eat that. He, she, he goes, but did God say? And he tells a half truth. He said, God knows you'll be, you'll be like God if you eat that tree. You'll know good and evil. Well, God doesn't know evil, but there was a half truth there, and a half truth is also still a lie. Amen? Right? It is. So he entices her, shows her, gives her this language of, hey, God's keeping something from you. And people always fall for that. 
in the process of sin, they start thinking what they have is not as good as what's over there. Whether it's adultery with another man or a woman, or it's, it's, it's a lifestyle of partying, man, they feel like they're missing out on what's best. Listen, God has already given you the best for your life, amen? It's important you recognize that. I want you to see something else. Death comes as a result. Now, I want you to see something as you go to Genesis chapter 2 because in that passage, look at what she does. She desired, she was deceived, she was disobedient. And what did she finally do? She died. She didn't die right away. She lived a long time. How do we know? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us how long Eve lived. We know that Adam lived. They were built to last how long? Forever. There, there was not a design for them to die. God, God knew that was, they would make this choice and disease and sickness would come and finally death. But they died spiritually right away, didn't they? God walked with them, came and ministered to them another time. But they used to walk with God every day. And they were hiding and they were ashamed because they knew they had sinned. Listen to this. It's important. This is a process that we go through over and over and over. Adam went through the same process. There was desire, deception, disobedience, and finally death. They died. Adam lived to be 930 years old. Methuselah lived to be 969 years old, the oldest male. Since women outlive men today, would it be logical to assume that women may have lived longer than men, than men did that's just not recorded in Scripture? Could there have been a thousand-year-old woman? There could have. I don't know that I want to see that. I don't even know if I want to see Methuselah at 969. I just, I'm just saying, that's all, all right? No, no, no sexist thing there, all right? Or at least I am intended that way. Look at the word picture that you read here in this passage. Verse 7 down to verse 12. There's defilement. These are from, from John Phillips in his commentary on, on Psalms. Just incredible Bible scholar. He said, defilement, cleanse me from hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Deafness, these are results of sin, what they do to us. Deafness, let me hear joy and gladness. Let, your bo let the bones that have been crushed rejoice. He doesn't have any joy in his life anymore. He's, he's in agony. Disgrace. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Listen to this. There's damage to us when we sin. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. And then he tells us that we're doomed. Do not cast me from your presence. Remember, we're Old Testament here. Spirits comes and goes. And take your Holy Spirit from me. And then there's a depressed state here. Listen, you know, lots of people have been depressed through the pandemic. They've been alone, isolated. They've just dealt with issues, been difficult for a lot of people. He says in verse 12, listen to this spiritually, what sin does to us. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant a willing spirit to sustain me. You hear all that? God's calling us to do just that. Last of all, look at sin has its cleansing. It really does. He takes personal responsibility for his sin. Notice his language. Verse 1, verse 2. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And then listen to the expression. According to your great compassion, blot out what? My transgressions. Watch this. Wash away all my, my iniquity. Look at the last phrase. And cleanse me from my sin. Listen, you've got to own it. All these 12-step programs talk about that there's got to be this understanding of a divine being. In CR, we talk about that divine being is Jesus Christ. We we're glad we have our Celebrate Recovery ministry here. We really are. They, they take it right to where it needs to go. But you also have to admit that you have a need and only God can meet you at that need. You've got to come to that. And that's exactly what David did. David goes beyond that. And he personally is repentant. Listen to verse 7 again. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me 
and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the my bones that you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant a willing spirit. Sustain me, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back. Listen, you remember the, the, the Shakespeare play? You probably watched it when you were young of Lady Macbeth. You remember when she'd committed murder and she just kept going around washing her hands and she had that little famous phrase in yeah, that she, that incredible line that was so revealing it, all the perfume in Arabia cannot sweeten this little hand. You know, on this tablet, I use this tablet, I got my Bible program on there and I've got a lot of other stuff, but I use it some during the week. It, primarily I use it for preaching, teaching. But I'll tell you this, there is a calculator on here. You know why I like the calculator on this, on, on this tablet? Because now that I am 60 years old, it's, it's big. I don't even need my glasses. I don't even have to put my glasses on. Don't even need anything magnified. One day, some of you that are young will relate. But right now, I'm telling you, I love the, I, I got one on my phone too, but I love the one on my tablet. And there's this really neat little button for when I make mistakes and I don't get a, I don't get a solution correct. I can hit the C button, which stands for clear. And I can hit the C button and it wipes out my mistake. Isn't that awesome? In the church of Jesus Christ, and those that need to hear the gospel today, the C button for us is Jesus Christ. Christ is the C button. And the way that you have your sin wiped out from your life is you come to Christ and you hit the C button in your life and you give Christ the proper place and the proper respect and you make him Lord in your life and you leave your sin. And guess what? Jesus has already died for your sin. So when you hit the Christ button in your life, he wipes out all your sin. Today, some of you might need to come and do just that today. You may need to hit the C button, whether you're online or you're here in the auditorium. You might need to hit the C button, hit clear. So we're going to do that today. We're going to invite you to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died, he rose, and came back to life for you. You put your hope in him, he'll give you eternal life. Listen. You might need as a Christian to come and just say, I'm not going to compartmentalize and justify sin in my life anymore. I'm going to come to the altar and confess this to Christ, and I'm going to get cleansed today. I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and we invite you to do just that.